Much more broadly, definitely. Do you agree well, with that, Joyce? I believe that the whole concept of relationship, we as women will demand that in a sense because we open up sexually when we feel loved and cared for and have that emotional connection. But there may be a period of exploration, like, and, and I think that we're talking about, you know, as, as adults, we're, we're preferring it this way. But without the risk of sexually transmitted diseases, without the risk of unwanted pregnancy, I think the, the, the teenage years will look different and the, and the early 20s will look different. And also the male-male the, the, the male pairing, the female-female pairing will but all be different. But in essence, I think that even with Viagra and the other drugs, in a sense, sex becomes less important to many people than the intimacy involved. Joyce, you made a very interesting point before. When sex is differentiated between goal-oriented and pleasure-oriented, uh, what, what happens in, in, in either case? Goal-oriented sex loses its, its power eventually, I mean, it, quite quickly. And it's a shame because, I mean, not a shame, but it's a shame many times for men because in our culture, more men are trained more than women, women more now than they used to be, that you're much more highly successful if you achieve your goal quickly. And yet in sex we tell you it's just the opposite. You know, take your time, slow down, enjoy the pleasure, don't go for the goal, don't raise the bar, uh, just enjoy that moment. And that's what works best. So we give you a flip and say, hey, what, what you're, we're telling you is great in the rest of life, it doesn't work in bed. Mm -hmm. But I think there are generational differences in this. I think that teenagers and young adults now, women in particular, are making much more explicit demands for their own sexuality in terms of partner choices, in terms of uh, sexual fulfillment, orgasm, and so on. Their expectations, they, they grew up in a very different era. Mm -hmm. And they're very sexually knowledgeable. Um, and they have very much in touch with their sexual needs and willing to, to explore those and demand satisfaction for those Paul, what, what can we learn from looking at uh, closely related primates to humans? Uh, can we learn about much about human sexuality we, by studying animal sexuality? We learn a lot, particularly from the bonobos. I think they're, they're the a bonobos great, are? They're our closest primate relative. Uh, they're <clears throat> sometimes referred to as a pygmy chimp, kind of in between chimpanzees and humans. And what we really learn from them is the diversity of their sexual behavior, which mirrors the diversity of human sexuality. Most no telephone sex. <laughs> <laughs> their positions are quite similar. Um, they, for example, they use the missionary position, which kind of kills the idea that this was the position uh, forced forced upon us. Maybe they were watching some miss missionaries. <laughs> I'm not sure the television existed back then. This show, I'm sure, did, but. Uh, um, I think what we learn from them is the extent to which the concept of natural extends to something beyond reproductive sex. The bonobos are like us who have act as if they read the Kama Sutra, the joy of sex. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cliff, do you see uh, human sexuality as going beyond the animal model? Oh, it absolutely has to, because unless we are able to make that, that deeper person connection, that soul connection, um, it, it doesn't have that meaning that we're all looking for. And we're having sex far more than just to, to reproduce, and yeah, but this, like you're saying. But do those have to match up? You talk mm -hmm. about the soul connection, and you talk mm -hmm. about many couples mm -hmm. that have very little sex and right. have that same intensity of relationship. I mean, well, I mean, so, see, the problem with humans is that is, is overpopulation. Not on it. We're an extraordinarily fertile species. Some could argue that oral sex is really a contraceptive activity because it doesn't end in, in reproductive mm -hmm. um, ends. And, and part of the problem with religious texts streamline or divert sex only for reproductive purposes, you basically enhance, enhance overpopulation in ways that it was never meant to be. I think the use of all these non-reproductive forms of sex are also a way of uh, extending and, and limiting the growth of, of our population because you get fulfillment mm -hmm. in non-reproductive ways. We always teach we've done a good job of fulfilling the command of being fruitful and multiply. A little too good. Cliff, um, uh, how does your theology influence uh, your approach to sex? Well, with the basic belief that, that we are created uh, to be in relationship, and then we think of sex as the, the highest expression of that relationship and that intimacy. And so it is really living out our humanness uh, in, in, its, in its ultimate form. It used to be, certainly, perhaps still is to some degree, that sex was classified by various religious groups among the worst of the sins. Is that changing? Well, I think it depends on who you have it with. 
Uh, <laughs> so, it, well, those are the boundaries. And yeah. who is doing the talking the within the religious yes. community? That's right. There's yeah. not agreement in the religious community on the joys of sex yet. Mm -hmm. but no. Is, is there change? There's yes, definitely, definitely change. And you're helping do it? We hope so. Good. Let's take a final question, and we want to do a prediction. A hundred years from now, fast forward a hundred years, what has happened to sex, Paul? Better condoms. Fern. Uh, more appreciative women. <laughs> <laughs> Joyce? The requirement of intimacy. But. And men becoming more complex in their sexuality so that they've moved in the direction of women. Is this all wishful thinking, Greg? Well, I don't know. There's a great diversity here of opinion, and I think that's what we're going to see in the future, that there are just going to be all sorts of kinds of coupling and, and linking uh, using technology, using pharmaceuticals. There are going to be all sorts of ways that people derive sexual pleasure in the future. I'm not sure it's progress, but eventually we will make better babies by cloning, and we will feel more intense sexual pleasure when stimulated electrically or chemically. But while technology may heighten physical satisfaction, it may also make true intimacy harder to achieve. And sexual intimacy has always been the basis of sexual fulfillment. How humans deal with their sexuality helps define what it means to be human. That won't change in the future, as even sex can bring us closer to truth. I'm Robert Kuhn.